The selection of the Apollo landing sites was, of course, a major task that had to be undertaken before going there. <clears throat> and it, uh, it took place over not only the period before we went on Apollo 11, but it continued on for several more missions until Apollo 17. Hal Masursky was involved in all of these activities. He has a perspective that <clears throat> very few people have of the selection of these Apollo landing sites. Hal has a background of 40 years with the U.S. Geological Survey. He was involved in the Ranger, Surveyor, and Orbiter programs prior to Apollo, the three programs to which Jack has just alluded. He was heavily involved throughout the Apollo program with the study of the Apollo landing sites. He has been involved heavily since then with various planetary programs. He has been one of our chief liaisons <coughs> with uh, the Soviets in their Venus missions. <coughs> he has also worked in the missions that we have sent to Mars. Right now and for the next month or so, he will be spending a great deal of time at the Jet Propulsion Lab as our Voyager will uh, <coughs> make its close approach to Neptune. So Jack has, I mean, uh, Hal has a great background <clears throat> in planetary science in general, and I think it would be a, a great uh, experience for all of us to hear his perspective on the process of selecting Apollo landing sites. Hal? Thank you, Bill. Um, I'm pleased to be able to talk to you today about uh, landing site selection because I think the popular supposition is that we uh, put a map of whatever planet we're studying up on the wall and get several darts and throw them. And that chooses the sites for us. It's uh, not quite that bad. Uh, we actually have uh, strong prejudices on uh, how to choose scientifically significant landing sites. It gets to be a difficult exercise because the engineers and managers say, would you like to have a failed uh, spacecraft in the most interesting spot on the planet? Or would you like to have one that survives in maybe a slightly less interesting place? And of course, that's a straightforward answer <clears throat> and they expect us to uh, fall in the line. But uh, we know, as practicing field geologists, that the most interesting stuff is always in the most difficult places to get to. And we're very familiar with that on the Earth, and we're very familiar with that in the planetary program. We worked very closely with uh, astronauts, and I think the managers had a little difficulty with our wanting to go to more difficult, more hazardous places. Because after, after all, these guys were friends, and we were interested in their survival, chiefly because we wanted the data to come back. <laughs> um, and the same thing has been true in the various other uh, planets that we have uh, visited. Another thing that we learned is that remote sensing of planetary bodies is expensive, but incredibly cheap compared with landers and landers with sample return. I'm now working on a group called the uh, MRSR, Mars Rover and Sample Return. And it has been going for some years. There's only one difficulty, no, two difficulties. First, the decision as to whether we're going to have a major Mars program has not been made. And because that decision has not been made, there's no money. So we're trying to run a precursor pro program and to find out as much as we can about Mars, only it's not supposed to cost anything. 
Now, we've gotten a lot cleverer uh, over the last 20 years, but we're not that clever. It's very hard to uh, do things with no money. I'm on a team called the Mars Observer Camera Team, and its budget for processing data that comes down is zero. Now, they set the telemetry rate very low because they didn't want the data to come back because if the data comes back, you have to look at it. And that costs money. And there's no money, so they tried to impose the lowest data rate possible. They didn't quite get to uh, the level of our first uh, planetary probe to Mars because we sent data back at 8 bits per second. We now have megabits per second from Earth orbital spacecraft. And of course, if we tried to encourage that idea at NASA headquarters now, they would all have a cardiac arrest because if we succeed in, in getting that much data back, then that makes them look that much worse because there isn't any money to look at it. Now, I'm in involved in the struggle of trying to study those sites and trying to do it on a minimum amount of money. And as I say, we've gotten clever, but we actually need, <clears throat> uh, let's say, creative accounting more than we need uh, Mars science. Um, I look back on uh, the choice of uh, landing sites on the moon with much fondness because I was a graduate student at Yale when Harold Urey, who discovered deuterium, uh, got interested in the moon. And he came and he gave what were called the Terry Lectures. And this was a series of lectures and he showed pictures of the moon taken at all the great telescopes. And since he's a chemist, he was most interested in the evolution of the whole body of the moon. Now he had a peculiar view, or peculiar to us, uh, it said the moon was entirely a product of impact. And since the impact is random, then you could land anywhere and you'd get the same stuff. So as far as he was concerned, any study of the moon to define landing sites was nonsense. And I had great respect for him because I think without his uh, very interesting work, and being the prominent scientist that he was, we may not have had a space program. So I honored him for, I think, being one of the principal divisors of the attempt to explore the moon. But I never agreed with anything that he said scientifically from then on. So we had several multiple confrontations because we would keep talking about pictures. And he said, pictures, pictures, what can you learn from a picture? He was a chemist, and he thinks a spectroscope is a scientific instrument, and a camera is nonsense. I mean, that's what you make movies from. Uh, it was difficult to convince him until he finally became aware that the engineers wanted to have a spacecraft that would survive and that means taking high-resolution pictures and picking a spot to land in that uh, will allow the mission to be completed. I think he became reconciled that the safety of the spacecraft was a valid reason for taking and looking at pictures, but certainly not for science reasons. So he uh, developed a great antipathy toward uh, uh, geologist and particularly geologist who wanted to take and look at pictures and uh, we never did really reconcile these quite different views and we have similar problems in the planetary uh, program because there are people that think that chemistry and physics of planetary bodies is fascinating and geology is nonsense they say you can't even interpret pictures of the earth how can you possibly interpret pictures of the moon, Mars, and the other planetary bodies? Well, we looked at the Maria and we saw lobate flow fronts. And they look very much like aerial photographs 
of basaltic lobate flow fronts, and we had low domes, and we took profiles of them, and he said, well, if that uh, is like a terrestrial volcano, its shield shape says that it's basalt. And they said, that's absolute nonsense, and you can't decide whether those are basalts or not. And Yuri used to belabor us uh, at every possible occasion. Then we flew the surveyors, and they had analytical instruments, and they sent back data that said what they were sitting on looked very much like a basalt. And I was with Yuri when that report was developed at Jet Propulsion Laboratory. He said, oh, oh, if that happens again, I'm in trouble. <laughs> it did happen again, and he was in trouble, because he was the leading spokesman for the so-called cold moon. And we all thought the moon showed lots of volcanic features, so we thought it had been hot. And lavas had come out to the surface, and it flowed, and formed a lava flow fronts and lava domes. And we were very confident that this was the case. And happily, Surveyor found that first, and then we brought the Apollo samples back. And uh, they fitted in with that thesis uh, very nicely. And then we had Tommy Gold, our other great help helper in uh, site selection. He was scared to death because he uh, had gone to school in uh, Switzerland, and he'd skied on glaciers. And he thought there would be crevasses, as there are truly in Switzerland, and you can fall through the crevasses. And he thought his fairy castle structure would make this uh, very lightweight material and the spacecraft would disappear. And if the astronauts got out of the spacecraft, if it hadn't disappeared entirely, they should wear um, bear paw snowshoes and tie an orange avalanche cord to their helmet. So if they fell in a crevasse, you could haul them out. And that, again, is a standard technique when you uh, ski glaciers in Switzerland. Well, we thought we, he had, uh, his youth had been misspent because he had acquired all these peculiar ideas. We had pictures of, uh, uh, from Lunar Orbiter that were very high resolution, and there were steep slopes. And boulders had rolled down these slopes, and it bounced across the surface. And these are boulders that weighed many, many tons. And we thought if Tommy were right, the boulder would have come down and gone glonk and gone out of sight. But there was this long trail of bounces, so apparently the surface could withstand the pressure of a many-ton boulder. So we didn't take uh, the necessity for snowshoes too seriously, but Tommy did right to the very end, and I don't think he's changed any now. Uh, but I went to literally dozens of meetings. Uh, one of the plans was to, as the lamb approached the lunar surface, to fire lightweight white balls out of the bottom and see if they disappeared. And the uh, uh, crewmen would gaze fixedly at these white balls, and if they disappeared, you hit the abort button. And uh, Tommy was a trial because everyone that I know that was in the lunar game in the early days all said at an AGU meeting, we had a panel. Well, I said a lot of things, and I was wrong about this and this and this. And Tommy gave his talk, and of course, he was wrong about nothing. Well, our view was he was right about nothing. So our views were comparable, just the sign was reversed. Uh, what we did is we mapped the moon at many scales, first uh, from the Lick Observatory Telescope and the Kitt Peak Telescope and the University of Virginia Telescope, because the pictures were not that good. And we sent people up every night as the Terminator went across the moon, and people were assigned to quadrangles to look at them very carefully. And the reason we sent people to the telescope is the atmospheric uh, motions uh, distort the images, and you can see two to three times as much 
telescopically, as you can see in photographs. And I walked through the lobby of Lick Observatory, and there was a display case, and there was the, these incredible lunar pictures. So I found out that they had been taken by a stellar astronomer because they had a 120-inch telescope at Kitt Peak, or rather at uh, Lick Observatory, and the best pictures had been taken with the 200-inch telescope at uh, Wilson Palomar. And he wanted to show that their telescope was better than the Palomar telescope. So he took lots of pictures. And he took pictures often enough that he would occasionally catch very, very quiet air. And he'd get these spectacular pictures. And he, I said, my god, they're the best pictures I've ever seen. Why don't you put them in Sky and Telescope? If you want to give credit to Lick, show that your pictures are better than anyone else's pictures. And he thought that was a neat idea. And they came out in Sky and Telescope. And he got a call from a Houston engineer. And the guy was violently enthusiastic. And he said, uh, what can you, we do for you? He said, go away and leave me alone, and hung up. He's a stellar astronomer, and he just wanted to show their telescope was very good. I was particularly intrigued because he took them with a, tele with a camera that had been built in 1898. And it had a focal plane shutter that was like a window blind. And he had two speeds for this camera. If you put the camera on and turned it so that the window blind fell down, that was high speed. And if you turned it the other way and it had to go up, that was slow speed. And I said, wouldn't it be nice to have a better camera? And god damn, he didn't like that, but I got gotten to know him fairly well by that time, so he graciously allowed us to build him a uh, better camera. And we had a, a Czech craftsman that built a spectacularly good camera. But the pictures weren't any better because it just took those few days a year of extremely quiet atmosphere that led to uh, the spectacular picture, not the fact that we had a fancier camera. Uh, when I asked him, you know, could we help? And he said, well, we need to rebuild the telescope. And uh, I said, fine, we think we can get money to do that because those pictures are really very good. And we rebuilt it. And uh, that helped. I said, well, is there anything else that we can do? Because he showed me how he took the pictures. And he took 8 by 10 plates, and they were in brass frames. And the frames weighed 12 pounds apiece. And there were four of them in a wooden box, which he wrapped in a dark cloth. And then he ran up and down four flights of stairs uh, to reload the plates. And so our great investment was to buy for, I think, about $15 a piece, lightweight wooden uh, 8 by 10 plate holders. So George Herbig could run up and down the stairs more often in an evening. And that was our first contribution to uh, acquiring better pictures of the moon to study landing sites. As we went through the various pre-Apollo missions, we got higher and higher resolution uh, images of more and more areas. And we found that it had some effect on the science because we thought the place to go and put a landing is where you have at least two geologic units and maybe three geologic units coming together. So if you can do a fairly short traverse, you can collect samples from a variety of geologic units. It turned out that the engineers thought that was nice, but what they really wanted to know was what was the roughness and how many meter-sized boulders that could kill a lunar module were there. And we got to that by looking at terrestrial craters and determining what the grain size of the material thrown out. And that was a function of the crater diameter. And when we got our first uh, high-resolution lunar orbiter pictures, they were not high enough resolution to see all of the fragments. But we counted the craters above a size that would give meter-sized boulders. And statistically, we could predict what a particular area had in the way of hazardous uh, uh, terrain. 
and we counted craters and we had help from the JSC people and they discovered something. We tried to take pictures with about a 20 degree sun angle because it, the shadows give you a very sharp perception of the terrain. And they found that the craters were fewer and fewer the higher the sun angle. So I said, well, you mean we should land at noon and then there would be no craters. And they thought about that for a while, but they weren't quite sure that was a fair statement. But we found that a 10 to 20 degree sun angle was spectacular for showing uh, very small terrain features on very flat areas. But if you got in rolling terrain, you got so many shadows that you couldn't see anything. So it turned out to be the proper sun angle for a particular piece of the moon was function of the terrain variations. So it got to be a fairly sophisticated game of determining how to take pictures with just the right sun angles. One of the things that we learn and we argue about now for Mars is, do you need terminal hazard avoidance uh, devices? Well, on Apollo 11, we had a terminal hazard avoidance device, an astronaut. He looked out the window, and he was going to land at the nominal landing point, which was right in the middle of a little crater called West Crater. It was full of enormous boulders and uh, would have done in the spacecraft. So he applied a little power and flew over it and landed on the other side, and all was well. From that, we say, it would be very nice to have a terminal hazard avoidance device and we hope that turns out to be a man before too long on Mars. We'll probably have to get along with some kind of kludged up uh, device that does this in real time. You can't send the signals back to Earth and have people look at it and tell the spacecraft to do something else because the round trip radio time is too long to allow that to happen. Apollo 12 we demonstrated that the objective was to land near a surveyor spacecraft, cut off, a piece, cut off a piece and bring it home, and to study what effects the solar wind had on a uh, spacecraft after several years. And we successfully landed very close to the surveyor site, and the guys walked out and cut off a piece and successfully brought it back. Apollo 13 had a small problem and we had a fancy camera aboard it. And I tried to get the Capcom to ask the guys to take some pictures of the moon when they went around on the far side. And of course, they were worrying about whether they were gonna get the guys back alive. So they said, no way are we going to tell them to do anything. I thought it would have been much better for the astronauts to have something to do rather than sit there and sweat, hoping that they were going to make it back to the Earth. But we didn't get pictures on 13. On 14, 15, and 16, and 17, we went to much more complex areas. And I think we got back an enormous amount of very useful information because we went to upland areas rather than looking at little tiny fragments of the uplands that had been thrown out into the Mari landing sites, we had good samples of upland materials, and we're still fighting about the interpretation uh, of those samples. And hopefully, those discussions will go on for some years to come. Because my guess is that returning samples from Mars will take several years. So if we have something to keep us busy, and occupied in arguing, then that will be uh, very good for us. There was one other thing that uh, didn't turn out as well as I would have liked. Uh, we were trying to decide on uh, the Apollo 17 landing site, or candidate landing site, and unfortunately I spent uh, an evening with Noel Henners, who was then the associate administrator for space science and applications. And we were in Houston and we looked at the just developed pictures and rolled through them. 
and there was a spectacular area with a big canyon in it and some very peculiar terrain. And Noel thought that was the most interesting thing he had ever seen. But then after we thought about it a bit, that said it was along the Apollo 15 track so that the orbital science coverage would be exactly the same as Apollo 15. So I brought this up at the landing site meeting and uh, the manager said, well, we've never let orbital science influence us before. Why should we do it now? Uh, so we flew Apollo 17 over s roughly the same tracks. I was trying to promote Gassendi, a big crater with a big central peak. And one of our objectives was to look at the central peaks because they were supposed to bring material up from very deep within the moon. Uh, if we had done that, we would have gotten spectacular photo coverage and chemical coverage of Mare Oriental, which is the youngest big basin on the moon. And I think it would have been a great feather in our cap because it is an enormously interesting structure. But uh, I didn't win that one. But you have to take your lumps occasionally. Now, why is this necessary? I mean, it's nice to review the history of Apollo and what happened. But the difficulty is that the corporate memory doesn't survive. All the managers change. All the navigators change. Uh, many of the scientists change. And it's very difficult to uh, say, well, we learned this on Apollo, so we should be smarter on Mars. Well, theoretically, that's the case. But actually, since the Mars decision hasn't been made, then all it does is cause some of the old timers real heartburn because, you know, we say, but we tried that and it didn't work, and we tried this and it did work. So why don't we do the one that worked rather than the one that didn't? But that's a very subtle, sophisticated, difficult point, which I've not been able to sell with much success. The real difficulty is that we know the kind of data that we need from Mars, and we're flying a spacecraft in two years, no, four years now, it just slipped two more years, called Mars Observer, which is supposedly a little tiny inexpensive spacecraft. But we developed a lot of very fancy instruments for it. But we can't afford the instruments, so those were thrown off. And it's very hard to clench your teeth and say, but why are we flying it if we're not going to put the things on it that we said we should have on it if we're going to fly. But fortunately, the Soviets are going to fly a 94 mission, and uh, they seem to pay more attention to the historical past, and we think they're going to fly the instruments that we had hoped to. Larry Soderblom of the survey has devised an instrument called a near-infrared mapping spectrometer, NIMS. And for Mars Observer, he proposed visible infrared mapping spectrometer, or VIMS. But it was thrown off. And the Soviets said, uh, gee, that would be a really neat instrument to fly because they have enormous uh, launch vehicles that can fly tons of whatever you would like to put aboard. So Larry is talking to them about devising a VIMS that would fly on a Soviet spacecraft, and we call that Vimsky. Now, I'm not sure whether Vimsky will survive. Uh, right now, everything looks great. And if uh, Bush and Gorbachev continue to be friends, maybe we'll get that vital, vital kind of data for, uh, from the next Mars mission. And then, hopefully, in 96 or 98, we'll fly the MRSR. And in 2010 or 2015, we'll fly a manned mission. Uh, that's about comparable to another one that I work on. It's called Cassini, we're doing with the European Space Agency. And that's a Saturn orbiter and Titan probe. And it's supposed to arrive at Saturn in 2003. You know, when I take my present age and add that many years to it, and I think that maybe my son might uh, 
look at that data. Uh, it's a beautiful mission, and the Europeans are very enthusiastic, and I hope we'll fly both an advanced Mars mission and a, uh, a Saturn mission that will have a surface science package, and it'll go down to the surface and measure the properties of the surface. That's a real challenge because we're not sure whether the surface is covered by solids, liquids, or gases. And if you say, what kind of instruments do I fly on a surface package that goes down? Do I make it so it floats? Do I make it so it has a probe to go into the ice? Or uh, to sample the ethane ocean, which is one of the theories of what it's covered by. So it's very challenging. And even our experience on the terrestrial planets doesn't help too much in interpreting the satellites of the outer planets because the farther out we go, the stranger the satellites look. And that's been true of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and we'll find out about Neptune in the very near future. We have a successful launch of Magellan that will map uh, Venus, all of the planet, at a resolution about 10 times better than what the Soviets did with their very successful Venera's 15 and 16. So we think that uh, the game is still very exciting, and there are serious proposals for a lunar base and for manned Mars expeditions, and we think the future is very, very bright. Thank you. If any of you have some questions for Hal, uh, shoot off uh, a question or two. Yes, we had. All right, we had very precise data on the composition of uh, the many instruments aboard uh, that spacecraft, and they found quite striking uh, changes due to solar wind implantation. And if we want long-lived spacecraft to go to various other planetary bodies, that gives good engineering data to help devise the protective shields so that spacecraft will last for many years on other planetary bodies. Wow. Well, uh, let me become spiritual for a moment. <laughs> we had a great curiosity to look at um, areas on the lunar far side. And as a matter of fact, I waged an unsuccessful fight to get repeater satellites taken up on earlier Apollo missions so that if you landed on the far side and were out of direct communications, you could still broadcast and kick it from satellite to satellite and bring it back to Earth. But uh, a Belcom engineer said there was no requirement. Well, of course, we didn't have a landing site on the far side, so uh, uh, we didn't have a requirement for the set of repeaters. Uh, very late in Apollo, it was proposed that we go to some spectacularly interesting far side features, but of course, since there were not repeaters to allow communications, they were dead on arrival. Um, if we had succeeded in launching those repeater satellites, then there are at least two areas on the lunar far side that are completely different from anything on the front side, and those would have been very high on my list. Well, when you say anyone, of course, there are people who spend their life looking at asteroids, 
And of course, those are the most fundamental things in the solar system. And anything else is a waste of time. It's also true that there are Earth-crossing asteroids, so it would be very easy to send an unmanned or a manned spacecraft to uh, an Earth-crossing asteroid and bring big hunks of it back. As a matter of fact, it's been seriously proposed that you take a big engine along and bring the asteroid back. <laughs>